Good evening. Good evening. Okay. All right. So uh, we want to start out first by thanking all of you for coming out here on a Thursday night. Um, you know, it's uh, brave in the brave in the heat. Certainly a, a, a warm one out there. But uh, I think you're going to find this a, a worthwhile use of your time. Um, you know, so here we are. We're back on campus. Right, you can feel the energy. Classes are getting going. We got our first football game this weekend. Uh, things are, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement in the air, and I think the timing is perfect for um, uh, having a presentation uh, like like this that we're going to have tonight. That that doesn't just talk about some of the challenges and issues that that we face and that business confronts, but that also talks about uh, a sense of optimism. How how this can actually be a great operating environment for business. What a great time it is to be preparing to enter the business uh, community. So um, with, with that in mind, I want to get us rolling here. Um, my name is Sam Miller, and as some of you might know, I'm, I'm one of the uh, Foresight instructors. And so on behalf of myself and Professor Cachot, Professor Harms, and Tim Balco, who's essential to our program, uh, we'd like to welcome you here tonight. And uh, and, and so we'll try to get, um, get right into the uh, presentation here. But I, a couple of things I want to point out. I think Professor Cachot has a sign-in sheet, so if you're in one of her sections, make sure you, uh, you, you get credit for being here tonight. Um, and also, I, uh, you can see we're, we're taping this, so the uh, presentation will be available. Uh, and there's also some uh, reading materials uh, posted by our speaker that are posted on Concourse. Okay, So there's lots of materials here. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, he's a, um, uh, a, a speaker that uh, has come down here and presented to our Foresight group multiple times. And it's, it's a great speech. And every year he's got more updates of, of, uh, of more business examples of how, um, how business can not only contribute to helping to solve some of the world's problems uh, and make this place a better uh, place to live on in terms of uh, um, you know, justice and, and energy and pollution and, and, uh, and uh, natural resources and all those sorts of things. Uh, but they can do so in a way that, is, that fits a business model that he's going to explain. Um, and uh, so Bill Marquardt is our speaker tonight. Uh, Bill is a uh, 1982 graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Okay, so he comes back, uh, to, um, uh, back to the Notre Dame community. He's a, um, uh, got an extensive resume that uh, is, um, is, is a great overlap with, with this concept we're talking about with Foresight. Uh, he uh, started his career with Ernst & Young, uh, was, had a, a successful run there, and actually started their strategy practice and worked with companies uh, like Walmart and McDonald's and AT&T and others uh, to, uh, to help them navigate strategically as we were just starting to understand some of these challenges and issues in the world of sustainability, okay? And um, uh, so he's got some great practical experience. Uh, he's, um, he's got uh, executive level leadership experience with uh, Fortune 500, and currently he uh, runs a uh, consulting practice out of Chicago uh, that is uh, a practice called the uh, Marble Leadership Partners, and they work with corporations on strategy and more specifically on triple bottom line and sustainability uh, opportunities. Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, have us all give a, a warm Notre Dame welcome to our speaker, Bill Marquardt. Thanks to Professor Miller and also to Professor Cachot and Harms and also Tim for all your help and hard work behind the scenes putting this all, all together. Um, it's great to be back here on campus. Um, you know, not only did I graduate in 1982, my older son uh, Christopher graduated from here in 2010, and Patrick is a junior business major. So um, I've got a lot of connections with the university. Um, I also have a confession to make. When I was here as an undergraduate, I was a philosophy major. And I got home at the end of my freshman year, and I told my, my parents I was going to be a philosophy major. And my dad kind of nodded at me. He was a lifelong truck salesman and really didn't understand what this was all about. So he walked over to the kitchen counter, and he picked up the yellow pages. And he put them in front of me at the kitchen table, and he said, if you can find philosophy listed in there, I'll pay for the rest of your education. So it was kind of dad's way of trying to make sure that I could still was employable coming out of, uh, out of the university. But what I ultimately found was that philosophy was one of the best uh, courses of study that I could have taken 
in order to really be successful in strategy and working for businesses. Because philosophy is about looking at disparate data. It's about connecting data points that a lot of other people don't see. And it's about putting together a path to prosperity and a path to success that the competition isn't seeing or can't get to as quickly. And that's a lot about what this foresight class is about. One of the reasons I'm so enthused that my alma mater teaches this and also requires foresight is that in my experience in the business community, um, foresight is one of the things that absolutely distinguishes you as an executive and as a professional from a lot of your peers that are also coming out of great undergraduate business programs around the country. Because as I used to do a lot of recruiting when I was with Ernst & Young and interacting with a lot of students when I was um, teaching at Kellogg and then also here, and what I find is that there are a lot of undergraduate business programs today that unfortunately are a lot like trade schools. They're really loading up students with a lot of rote things to memorize and to apply, whether that's accounting rules or black Scholes option pricing models or discounted cash flow. And a lot of students, after they get into the business, into a, uh, into a corporation, they exhaust those skills within about a four or five year time period. And it's your ability to apply skills like foresight and being able to recognize trends and especially recognize disruptions that are coming up in the community that is a, an essential way for you to distinguish yourselves as you launch what I hope are very successful business careers. One of the other things I want to just mention and just give you as context within your foresight class is the mistake that a lot of people make in business is they extrapolate. They extrapolate from current trends and current trend lines and do a nice you know, linear regression model you know, up or down depending upon the situation. Business and the economy and the world are dramatically punctuated by disruptions. I guarantee you you'll be wrong if you extrapolate a trend into, into perpetuity and into the future. What's really essential is to understand what are those disruptions, disruptive technologies, disruptive events, et cetera, because those are the opportunities that are really created for profit and for opportunity. So before we get into a kind of the social responsibility as a, as a business process and as a business opportunity, what I want to do is, is really start with a foresight example from um, my own business experience. There was a client that I was working with back in 1996. It was a technology company that was, had been around for about 18 years. It was publicly traded, but it was really beginning to kind of wallow and lose its way. And in February of 1996, uh, we were in uh, the midst of a $1.4 billion loss year, which those numbers don't seem that big now, but 15 years ago, a $1.4 billion operating loss was huge. I was working with the board of directors of this company, and what we were doing is we were evaluating our bankruptcy options. We were evaluating how could we restructure the company. We were running out of cash. Did we need to go into bankruptcy? What was the right way to ultimately position the company for success going forward? Um, after that discussion, I will say that uh, this was probably the most incredible turnaround story that I've ever seen in my business career because it was Apple. In February of 1996, I was working with the board of directors at Apple trying to decide whether we should file bankruptcy or not. They fired Michael Spindler, who was their CEO, and brought in Gil Emilio. Steve Jobs was still out of the picture. And Steve ultimately came back and rejoined the company because Apple acquired Next Computing, which was kind of a middling, failing software company that Steve started after he got booted from Apple. But by getting Steve back into the sequence at Apple and back into the corporation, it's one of the great, best examples and probably a tangible example that we've all seen of how foresight works. Because we went from a company that had a billion dollars of market capitalization teetering on the edge of bankruptcy 15 years ago to a company which you probably saw the stories back on August 9th. Apple, for a brief period of time, had a higher stock market valuation than Exxon. It was the most valuable company in the planet from a shareholder value perspective. And almost all of it was attributable to some of the foresight that Steve brought to the table. Let's start with just a couple things and start with the iPod. The, the for, w w as Jobs looked at, at the market and looked at what was going on with technology, MP3 players were around. They had started to replace the Sony Walkman, which at the time was the king of mobile communications and mobile music technology. 
But what Steve saw was not an opportunity to just extend an MP3 type of technology. Instead, what he realized is that he could actually literally disrupt and radically change the entire recorded music industry. Um, how many of you are familiar with the old story or the strategy of razors versus razor blades? Okay. What happens is a consumer products company, generally what they do is they sell their razors really cheap, and then they sell the blades very expensively. They'll even give the razor away for free to lock you into buying blades that cost seven, eight, ten dollars for a package of five or six at a very high markup with a very high profit. What Jobs did is he radically changed that model because he started selling the iPod, the razor, very expensively, but then sold the songs, the, ra the blades themselves, very inexpensively for 99 cents. So by creating the iTunes store and creating a vehicle that could not only sell the razor, but also sell the razor blades at virtually no cost except for the cost of servers and computing capacity, he radically changed the industry. Um, my wife is the chairman of the board of the largest radio network in the, in the world, and it's fascinating to watch through her eyes what's happened to the recorded music industry over the last 10 years. Because 10 or 15 years ago, a record company was dying to have a song from one of their artists played on the radio. Because if the song was played on the radio, people were going to hear the song, and then they would go, to the, they would go and buy the CD and, and play it, and that's how the record company made its money. That was its economic model. The record companies have been so disrupted by Jobs' foresight and what he did 10 years ago with iTunes that they're still struggling to hold on to an old economic model that's no longer viable. And the record companies are now in front of Congress trying to force radio stations to pay the record company every time that they play a song on the radio. And it's, it's an effort on the part of the record companies to hold on to an old economic model that by no means is, con is continued to be viable. And that entire industry has been trumped by the foresight that Steve brought to the table in recognizing the flip in razors and razor blades. And by creating his own new business model, he was able to launch the iPod. Now, it's interesting because then you get to the, the MacBooks and the MacBook Pros and those computers. In the mid-2000s, 50% of first-time Mac buyers were introduced to Apple because of the iPod. So the iPod was really the singular technology that launched Apple to where it is today. Second, we have the iPhone. Okay, and in the case of the iPhone, it was Steve recognizing that as you head out into the future, that the computing power that we hold in our hands is going to be much, much more powerful than what we can just do with texting. And it was recognizing the fact that computing power is moving from stationary or laptop devices into portable devices that launched the, um, the iPhone. And then you've got the iPad, which was a rehash of the Newton that Steve was involved in trying to build um, about 15 to 18 years ago. It ended up not being successful because it was really ahead of its time. But the, 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 the trend, the disruption that, that Jobs and Apple recognized with the iPad is that computing power is moving away from the lap and is instead going into the cloud and going into the web. And by having um, smart or you could call them dumb devices that you're holding in your hand that don't have to have software loaded on them, what they're doing, what they've done is they've effectively created an environment um, and recognize that that environment is, is coming and is already here when your applications can be out on the web and you don't necessarily need to have that much computing power um, in, your, in your handheld device. When you look at the announcement that he just made in April of the iCloud and the $500 million server farm in North Carolina that Apple's building, that's the next step in the technology. And what he's recognizing is he's pushing the technology a step further and recognizing that pretty soon we will no longer need to have any kind of software capability with the possible exception of apps in our hand and everything is going to be in a server environment and accessible to you on the web. What's fascinating about this foresight is effectively what he's doing is he's disrupting his own technology and disrupting his own competitive advantage because the iCloud will now have born to run one copy sitting on the cloud on the server, 
rather than being on a half a million or five million iPods around the country. So you won't necessarily have to have that song on your handheld device anymore. One copy of the song on a licensed basis is going to be sitting on the cloud that you'll be able to access from wherever you are where you've got streaming Internet capabilities and capacities. So with this technology, what Jobs has done is he's actually disrupted and made obsolete the iTunes store and the iTunes technology that was such a critical element for him 10 years ago. So you know, it, it, that's probably the most extreme example that I've seen in my own business career of how foresight really works. And it was Steve's reintroduction to the business way after I had left and wasn't working with Apple anymore. But to know that they went from a bankruptcy discussion to the most valuable company in the world is a massive turnaround that's completely, I, I would say is completely attributable to the benefits of foresight. And with Steve and also his developers like Jonathan Ive, his industrial designer and others really brought to the table. So what, I'd, um, what I want to do today is uh, I'm going to sh shift the discussion um, a little bit. And I'd, I'd like you to focus on today's presentation really at two levels. Um, what I want to do is the content that we're going to talk about is social responsibility and the business opportunity that's inherent within social responsibility. So at one level, there's a lot of content here around the emerging and converging social responsibility trend. But at another level, what I want to do is I want to demonstrate how we've used foresight in our firm to recognize emerging business opportunities and to bring our clients to take advantage of creating value from those opportunities. So level one is content on social responsibility, but at level two, I'm going to demonstrate how to use foresight uh, to really pull some of these opportunities together. Um, also let you know that um, these slides, I'm going to send a PDF of the slides to, uh, to Tim later tonight, and they'll post it to the class website. So, Take notes on what you want to right now, and then you'll get a copy of the slides um, as early as tomorrow to download. So I want to start with where business executives' minds are today. Where's the CEO's head relative to social responsibility? And unfortunately, in business today, we're still living under the cloud that was cast by an economist named Milton Friedman who wrote a very important essay in 1970 in the New York Times Magazine. And this is an excerpt of his, um, of his uh, essay. He said, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase, increase its profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say it engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. So Friedman basically laid down the gauntlet and laid down the rules of the game for social responsibility that we've been playing under and under the shadow of for the last 40 years. Because what's important here is to unpack the argument that Friedman is making and the impact that it has on today's CEO and board of directors. First, Friedman is stating that the responsibility of uh, the only responsibility of an executive is to conduct the business to make as, ma as much money as possible while conforming to basic rules of society, either laws or ethical customs. And clearly with um, WorldCom and Enron and Bernie Madoff and ZZZ Best and everything else that's out there, we've got a lot of examples of somebody that are violating the second half of that statement. But the first thing that Friedman's hanging his hat on is that the only responsibility of business is to make as much profit as possible. Management is basically an agent of the individuals who own the corporation. Management is not a principal. They're an agent acting on behalf of the shareholders. When an individual acts on social responsibility, a member of management, they're acting as a principal, not as an agent. So when, the, um, when General Electric's CEO decides to donate $1,000 of corporate funds to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, he's acting, Freeman's arguing that he's not acting in his role as an agent for the shareholders. He's acting for his own personal interests, and he's suddenly become a principal in terms of how the corporation is spending its money. money. If a manager has social responsibility in his capacity as a business person 
It must mean he's to act in a way that's not in the interests of the employer and not in the interests of shareholders. And when a manager acts as a principal, he is, in effect, deciding how the corporation should be taxed or how proceeds of the corporation and proceeds of their income are spent. However, when a manager, a manager is supposed to be acting as an agent and not a principal, therefore, the conclusion is that social responsibility involves the acceptance of a socialist view that it's okay for managers who are agents to act as principals and make their own decisions about social responsibility. So Friedman laid down this argument, which I'm sure you've got a lot of different points of view and arguments for and especially against. But effectively, as business executives, we, we've been living under that shadow. I call it the great or of business, that we either need to make a profit or be socially responsible, but we can't do both. And unfortunately, the solutions that we see in business today are actually perpetuating the or rather than the and. Um, Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for Grameen Bank, proposed a, a for-benefit corporate structure or a social benefit corporation. It's a corporation that kind of acts like a C corporation, but it, maximi it, it only earns a maximum of 0% or 2% return and everything else gets plowed back in the community. So even there, he's created a hybrid organization structure that goes separate and distinct from a traditional C corporation. So the first data point I want to map is Friedman in 1970, and the essay is, aff is affectionately referred to as the business of business is business. Second data point is the UN's Brundtland Commission, which in 1987 drafted a statement or a definition of sustainability, which in my experience has really withstood the test of time. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I, mean, I think it's a very, very well-written statement, and when you use this as a decision rubric, you're actually able to see the decisions that need to be made related to environment and related to some social responsibility, et cetera. So the second data point is we've got the Brundtland Commission laying out a fairly good definition of sustainability. Third data point, triple bottom line. How many of you have heard of the triple bottom line? What are, what are the elements of the triple bottom line? Social, okay. Environment and economic, great. So there's three elements of the triple bottom line. They're either called, they're social, economic, and environmental, or it's oftentimes condensed to people, planet, and profit. This is another example <coughs> of the great or of business because um, executives that I work with really struggle with the triple bottom line. Okay, and the reason is it creates a corporate schizophrenia. Am I supposed to optimize people or profit or planet? Because if I can't simultaneously optimize all three, it's potentially problematic. It sounds great in concept and it sounds great in principle, but as a day-to-day -day decision making uh, vehicle, this model really starts to fall short. What's interesting is when you look at how business has been evolving over the last um, uh, eight years in particular, when environmental sustainability began to get linked to economic sustainability, that was where environmental sustainability started to gain traction in corporate America. Okay? When Walmart decides that it's going to increase the efficiency of its entire distribution fleet, the fuel efficiency by 10%, okay, it's good for the environment, but it also reduces logistics costs because you don't have to pay as much for fuel. When Walmart decides to eliminate the dumpster at the back of the store where you put all the packaging and the crates and the cartons and everything, it serves an environmental responsibility of reducing landfill, but anything that's thrown into the dumpster in the back of the store is non-value-added product cost. It's, it's material that, that Walmart had to pay for. When they bought a case of macaroni and cheese, they had to pay for the cardboard that came with that case too, and that cardboard got thrown away. So one of the things Walmart's done is the Walmart 2020 program is they've challenged all their vendors 
to have absolutely no disposable packaging by the year 2020. And one of my clients is a packaging company. We're struggling to figure out how to solve that one, but we know that if we do, we've got a great opportunity from a foresight perspective to leapfrog the other packaging competitors um, that we face in the marketplace. So it was only when environmental sustainability became linked to economic sustainability that environmental became mainstream. Uh, you know, General Electric, with its Echo Imagination program, committed to generating $20 billion of incremental revenue from environmentally friendly products over a seven-year period. When you introduce something like that, when it's tied to revenue and it's tied to the bottom line, that's where it gains traction. One of my foresight predictions and one of the things that we see coming is that social responsibility will soon get linked to economic responsibility. And corporations that are able to find a way to solve social issues and do it profitably are the ones that are going to win in this new economy. And in a few minutes, I'm going to give you three examples of corporations that have been successful at doing that. So our third data point was Elkington's triple bottom line, the fact that we started in 1994 to, to think about this confluence of these three elements, social, environmental, economic, or people, profit, and planet. So that gives us another data point, but we're still living under the great ore of business. Then came Peter Drucker. And right before Drucker passed away, Peter said that every single social and global issue of our day is really a business opportunity in disguise. And when you think about the use of foresight in business, this is what foresight is all about. Every single social and global issue is a business opportunity in disguise, but it's a matter of, matter of recognizing what those trends are and a matter of recognizing those disruptions so that you can take advantage of it from a profitability perspective. So our fourth data point becomes uh, Drucker's comment. A fifth data point is Interface Carpet. Interface is a fascinating uh, company. Uh, what they did is they're the, co the company that makes industrial carpeting and carpet tiles. So that could very well be what's in this room. Or if you walk into an office or a classroom and there's two-by-two-foot two foot carpet squares that are there on the floor, those are likely made by Interface Carpet. Um, highly polluting industry, highly environmentally damaging industry. Most of that stuff is made from um, oil-based derivatives, not only the, uh, the rubber underlayment, but especially the fibers themselves. Um, if the building ever starts on fire, the fumes from the carpet will get you away before the fire does. What their CEO did in 1996 is he set a goal, uh, a, a zero, um, zero impact goal, where he said, I want us to be environmentally neutral. I don't want us to have any carbon footprint by the year 2020. And since he laid out that challenge, the company has been working slowly but surely toward achieving that goal. What's interesting is they've had about, as of now, they've got a 62 to 63 percent reduction in their carbon footprint since they started this, they launched this initiative. Their profits have also increased 55 percent, and their revenue has gone up even more during this time period. So what, what Interface was able to do was to prove to the industrial business community that environmental and profit aren't mutually exclusive. Because what happened was not only did they think of new ways of doing things that reduced in internal and ingoing product cost, but they were also able to get a competitive advantage in the marketplace because they recognized that what was coming was corporations, building owners, and landlords that were going to become much more concerned with environmentally products within their construction. And therefore, they were the first to market with the kinds of carpets and other building materials um, which could be um, not only used, but which could be certified as being environmentally friendly. So again, interface, another data point that people are starting to recognize by 1996, and especially in early 2000, that when you link environmental and economic sustainability, it's a potential sor source of shareholder value. So now we move to three corporate examples. The first one is Dan and Yogurt. Um, Dan and CEO challenged his leadership team four years ago to try to address the malnutrition problem in Bangladesh. What their research and development and marketing team did was they developed a highly nutritious yogurt product. It's manufactured in small footprint 7,500 square foot plants. 
It's manufactured from milk that's purchased from local farmers. And the product is shelf-stable. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. And it's distributed through the network of Grameen phone ladies that sell prepaid phone services for Grameen Bank and for the Grameen family of companies. So what's ended up happening is, um, not, first of all, Dannon has solved a social issue because they've created this highly nutritious yogurt product, which, by the way, only sells for seven cents a cup. Um, this is a picture from their annual report of one of the villages where this, where this yogurt is being distributed. So they've come up with a way to address the malnutrition problem. They're doing it in a way that is developing the economy locally because they're able to um, buy the milk from local farmers and manufacture locally. But what's also interesting is that the, um, what they've learned about small footprint manufacturing from these 7,500 square foot plants, they've now taken what they've learned and they're exporting it around the world to their larger manufacturing facilities. So they've generated operating efficiencies from introducing this constraint of coming up with a, ba with a Bangladesh solution. And last year, they introduced this same yogurt into the French market as an opening price point yogurt product. So they've not only innovated a new product, but they've developed a new market in both Bangladesh, in Bangladesh and also in France. And it's all because the challenge was find the and between social responsibility and also revenue and profit. Second example is, uh, is Walmart. Um, there's a, a village that... Um, we've worked with in Guatemala called Santa Cruz. Um, in fact, my wife, Leslie, and Patrick and I were there a couple years ago. And what's interesting is when you go to these villages, you see these rich, fertile farmlands surrounding the village where they grow carrots, radishes, corn, potatoes. Guatemala is known as the land of eternal spring because almost all year the, the temperature is between 70 and 83 degrees, so it's perfect for growing. Radishes go from seed to harvest in 30 days. It's one of the quickest turnaround crops there. Yet when you go into the villages, what you see is abject poverty. People living on $2 a day family income. We visited one family where there was a five-year-old girl that weighed 31 pounds because she only ate if dad worked in the field and earned $2 that day. So you've got families of eight that are trying to live on $2 a day and it seemed like a huge disconnect. Incredibly rich, fertile farmland, lots of labor, and abject poverty. So we struggled to figure out what was going on, and that was when we saw the middleman come to town. Santa Cruz doesn't have any access to the open market. So what happens is middlemen will come to town in their pickup trucks. They'll buy the produce from the villagers for 10 cents on the dollar for what it's worth. They drive to the market, they mark it up, they sell it, and they make a 90% profit. These farmers didn't have access to the market for their products, and therefore there was never an opportunity for them to grow out of extreme poverty. So along comes Walmart, USAID, and Mercy Corps. Walmart created something called the Inclusive Market Alliance for Rural Entrepreneurs, and the idea was to plug indigent Guatemalan farmers and villages into the Walmart supply chain in Central America. So what happens is, the villagers benefit because they now get a steady demand for product at real market pricing. But what's in it for Walmart is that they get a consistent source of locally grown produce, therefore higher sales. And they also have lower logistics costs because instead of trucking the, the carrots six hours from Mexico, they're only trucking it two hours from the village of Santa Cruz into Guatemala City. So therefore their logistics and transportation costs are lower. So Walmart found a way to serve a social need, indigent Guatemalan farmers, and also serve their bottom line uh, profitably, living up to Drucker's comment that every social and global issue of our day is a business opportunity in disguise. Third example is Walgreens. Um, this is a fascinating story. One of my clients is the American Association of People with Disabilities. And one of the statistics that stuns, frightens, scares, and saddens me is the fact that there's still a 45% unemployment rate among people with disabilities in the United States. It's a tragedy. And what happens is if you've got, um, if you've got epilepsy or you've, you're autistic or you've lost a limb or whatever, your employability or the expectation of your employee, employability 
drops dramatically. Well, there's a, a friend of mine, one of my former partners at Ernst & Young, a guy named Randy Lewis, is now the Senior Vice President of Distribution and Logistics for Walgreens, and he has a highly autistic son. And his son was turning 18, and Randy became really burdened with, what, what's my son going to do? He's becoming an adult, but in the American culture, he's unemployable. How do I fix this? What's the future for him? What are the opportunities? So what Randy did is he spearheaded an effort at Walgreens, and he launched the distribution center in Anderson, South Carolina. And of the 700 positions in the distribution center, 42% um, over 42% of them were filled by people with disabilities. In a distribution center, imagine, uh, imagine a building the size of about um, four or five football fields with five levels of racking and aisle after aisle after aisle that has everything from, uh, from Pampers to Tylenol to Excedrin to um, uh, food products, et cetera, just stacked floor to ceiling with pallet jacks and forklifts driving around. Those 700 employees are taking in orders that come in from a Walgreens store every day and picking cases of this product, cases of that product, and building them into a pallet or putting them in totes to be shipped to the store. So what Randy figured was that he said, I, he convinced management, give me a distribution center, and I want to prove that people with disabilities can be just as productive as the general population. Interestingly, he was wrong because the Anderson, South Carolina facility is 20% more productive than the average of all Walgreens distribution centers in the country. There are no special accommodations that are made, et cetera, but what they found is that their turnover is much lower, their productivity is higher, the commitment and loyalty of employees is much greater because they're so thankful to have the job and have the ability to contribute and have an identity and an ability to contribute to society. And as a result of that, um, Walgreens has now committed in its 20 distribution centers around the country that 10% of all of their open positions, production positions, are going to be filled by people with disabilities. And <clears throat> what um, they've just decided, they're doing a test now in Dallas, they're also trying to make that same 10% commitment to people that are working in a Walgreens store. So again, you've got an example of the social issue Social responsibility issue is the unemployability or the unemployment rate among people with disabilities. And by Walgreens being very focused on it, not only did they serve the social good, but they've increased their productivity by 20% and they're taking this model further around the country. So the other data points that we have here are the Dannon, Walmart, and Walgreens that I just shared with you. The question then becomes, what's the market opportunity when you connect these disparate data points that have been accumulating since as far back as 1970. What can we do? Any, any suggestions? Are there corporations that can solve social issues? Yes or no? We'll, we'll, make, we'll, we'll make it a binary question, yes or no? Okay. Are there corporations that can be profitable doing that? Okay. So the answer and the trend is that the winning corporations in this emerging economy are the ones that are able to find the and between profit and social responsibility. And the key to finding the and, there's three elements to this. Corporations are generating innovation, growth, and shareholder value. They're doing it using the assets of the core business to address major social issues. And the thing I want to emphasize here is that this focus is on the core business. This is not philanthropy. This is not writing a check and sending it to the Salvation Army. This is about embracing a social issue that you can address within the corporation in a way that's profitable. And the beauty of it is that we're finally beginning to escape the shadow of Milton Friedman from 40 years ago. 
Okay, because we don't have to debate the role of a corporation in society anymore or how much does a corporation need to get involved in social responsibility. Because if a corporation can solve a social issue and do it profitably, you're still satisfying your social responsibility and your fiduciary responsibility at the same time. Um, so the solution is to turn corporate social responsibilities into corporate opportunities, a la Peter Drucker's quote, and then turn those social opportunities into sustainable competitive advantages, either profit, cash flow, shareholder value, and the like. So as we've worked with corporations and we've studied corporations, what we found is that there's basically four stages of finding the and that a corporation goes through. The first is pure philanthropy. There is little alignment between corporate social responsibility and the company's business strategy. Um, basically, what ends up happening, th this, these are the corporations that are actually fulfilling Mark Milton Friedman's essay from 40 years ago. Because basically what they're doing is, I'm writing a check and I'm giving it to this organization and I'm writing a check and giving it to that organization. There's no alignment between the business strategy and their social responsibility. I would contend that that is potentially an inappropriate transfer of shareholder value from the corporation and from the shareholders away to non-governmental organizations and charitable organizations. J&J um, &J is in this box. I know the head of social responsibility at J&J, &J, and when I went through this with him, he put his finger right there and says, this is where we are. Okay? We, may, um, we, 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 we contribute to things more in order to buy favor and curry favor and avoid and, and try to kind of place the bet that people won't sue us or the activists won't go after us, but there's no alignment. The second level of finding the and is what we call strategic philanthropy. This is where giving begins to become aligned with business strategies. Um, my favorite example is PetSmart. PetSmart decided a long time ago that they were going to focus all of their philanthropic activities on avoiding the euthanasia of, of homeless pets. Well, obviously that serves a great social good, but it's also aligned with their business strategy because when you have adopt-a-pet programs in the store every month, the employees love it because they're pet lovers. The customers love it because they're pet lovers. And since PetSmart started the adopt-a-pet program, there are four million more dogs and cats that need food and toys. So it's also accretive to shareholder value for PetSmart. They've aligned their philanthropic strategy with their business strategy. Now, the challenge that corporations have here and what many corporations miss, and one of the things I'd encourage you to think about, because as you get started in corporations in a couple of years, you're going to see their philanthropic activities. You're probably going to be asked to join or get involved in something. The question I'd encourage you to ask is, what are we learning from this philanthropic activity that can inform and add value to the core business? Because that feedback loop is what most corporations miss. Great example is the banking industry. Almost every major bank um, sponsors a financial literacy program, generally in the urban core, in food deserts, and impoverished areas and communities. Okay, they go in, they provide training, basics on budgeting, balancing a checkbook, et cetera, et cetera. It took upstart startups like NetSpend and Green Dot to create the prepaid debit card market. If banks had been paying attention when they were in those financial literacy programs all around the country, banks would have created the prepaid debit card program way before Green Dot and NetSpend and everybody else got there. 12% um, of Americans are unbanked. They don't have bank accounts. Okay, how do you serve that 12%? Well, prepaid debit cards are hugely profitable for banks and financial institutions, but it took somebody from outside the industry to find out because they weren't taking advantage of what they could learn from the philanthropic activities that the banks were involved in. The third stage of finding the and is strategic sustainability. Um, this is where you are literally addressing social needs using the assets of the core business. Um, the Dan and Walmart, Walgreens examples I gave you clearly fit into strategic sustainability. The last level is advantage. This is the last stage of a corporation that is trying to find the and. Um, there are only a handful of companies that are operating at an advantage level, and generally it's because the whole concept of social responsibility has been wired into the strategy and the culture and the way of doing business. 
Whole Foods is an example. Patagonia, REI, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, companies like that are examples where social responsibility has been so ingrained and interwoven that they don't consider a business strategy without also considering the social implications related thereto. What's also important to recognize on this chart, and you'll see it in the article too, is the dotted line down the middle. The first two stages are operating in the philanthropy department, in the community relations department. And the second two, the top two stages, are operating in the core business. That's the difference between cost and profit. What corporations do in the first two layers is a cost to the philanthropic expense line in the balance, on the income statement. What they're doing above that is generating profit for the firm. It's generating sales of Dan and Yogurt. It's generating reduced product or operating costs and logistics costs at Walmart. It's creating more uh, uh, distribution center efficiencies at Walgreens, and there are many, many other examples. The, uh, one other thing I want to leave you with is that if you look at the four, the four middle column headings, what our research and work has shown is that when corporations find the and, there are one or more of four buttons of um, strategic competitive advantage that are pushed. Market development, product innovation, operating efficiency, and culture building. So in the case of Dannon, they developed a new market in Bangladesh and then went to France. They innovated a new product, this highly nutritious seven cent yogurt. Um, and the operating efficiencies from the small footprint plants, they took around the rest, of the, the rest of the company. At Walmart, they developed a new market because they're trying to kind of build the ability of not only um, greater sales within Guatemala City and Central America from locally grown product, but they think they're ultimately beginning to develop a market among these farmers that are bootstrapping out of poverty. And they've especially pushed the operating efficiency button because of lower logistics costs. And then lastly, Walgreens is, almost, is primarily focused on operating efficiency, but Randy will also tell you that the cultural impact at Walgreens from the experiment that they did in Anderson and they're now taking around the country has been dramatic because it's really changed a lot of conceptions, preconceptions, and misconceptions about people with disabilities as viable members of the workforce. The last column demonstrates something else that's important. And whether you intend to go to work in a corporation or whether you intend to go to work in a nonprofit, the message here is the same. Almost every corporation that we work with or that we've studied in this area always has to team with a relevant non-governmental organization in order to truly unlock the shareholder value inherent in finding the end. Okay, Dannon didn't have a distribution system for its yogurt, so the only way to make it work was to team with Grameen Bank to do the distribution. Walmart had to team with USAID to provide funding and Mercy Corps to train the farmers in basic business principles of invoicing and product management, etc. Walgreens teamed with the University of North Carolina to create an overall training program and then teamed with a lot of local, locally based disability organizations to identify and train the employees that were coming to work in their, in their plants. So if you're a corporation and you're going to work, if you're going to work for a corporation, one of the questions you need to ask it is, who are the relevant NGOs that we should team with in order to get the most value out of this social responsibility effort? If you're a nonprofit, the fascinating question that I love to ask nonprofit executives is, are you the answer to a question that a corporate partner hasn't asked yet? Are you the answer to a question that a corporate partner hasn't asked yet. Because the typical nonprofit is walking around from foundation to foundation and community relations department to community relations department with their hands out asking for a donation for this, that, or the other program. When the nonprofit's able to go to the corporation and say, you know, we have this specific training capability for people with disabilities and we've achieved this kind of productive efficiency with other corporations that you're working with, we'd like you to give us a $100,000 grant, and in turn, we're going to provide you with up to 100 employees a month that can work in your business that are trained and ready to go with disabilities. Suddenly, the whole equation changes because the nonprofit is now demonstrating the corporation the value that it can bring to the table. So it radically changes the discussion and the conversation. So... 
in summary, we I talked about we wanted to be at two different levels here. From a content perspective, where social responsibility has been is uh, the, uh, the cloud of the great ore of business. And many corporations that you go to work with are still going to be living under that ore, um, especially at the senior management and at the board level. And there may be pockets within your organization that are thinking differently, but you've got a great opportunity to bring a fresh set of eyes and to just ask some questions. Hey, couldn't we solve this and also generate revenue or generate reduced costs? So from a content perspective, what's happening is as social responsibility becomes linked to economic sustainability, that's where it's going to take off in corporations. We're about eight years behind where environmental sustainability is now on the social side. But then at the second level, which is demonstrating foresight, you'll see that what we've done is we've taken all these disparate data points, Friedman, the Brundtland Commission, Interface Carpet, Peter Drucker's quote, these corporate examples, and by linking them together, we recognize that there's an opportunity. And when we go out and talk to senior executives and CEOs, we're able to give them a fresh perspective. You know, every CEO I know right now wants the recession to be behind him or her. And there's a point at which the CEO realizes that he or she can't cost cut their way to prosperity, and they start asking the growth question. And the finding the and as a lens, as a new way of looking at innovation and growth, is a brand new way of answering that growth question that most senior executives and corporations haven't looked through yet. So as we come out of this recession and the, and the economy begins to expand, this becomes a very, very important um, component. So with that, I, um, that's the end of my prepared comments. I want to spend about 10 minutes or so on whatever questions that you may have about this material or even uh, more broadly. But don't ask me the philosophy questions because that was a long time ago. Uh, do you mind me asking how you got involved in this line of work and in this type of consulting? Um, consulting in, in general or this in particular? Okay. Um, in in uh, Marble Leadership Partners, our specialty is strategy and business transformation. And what, uh, what, I, what I was trying to do is to find what's the new hook. You know, what's, what, what are the emerging issues and trends that we need to be aware of? And how can we go in to speak to a senior executive team with a fresh and new perspective. So that was one thing that drove me. You know, the other thing that, quite frankly, that drove me is, you know, and, and coming as we do from a university like this, you know, we have a biblical responsibility to the least, the last, and the lost. And I've struggled with how you reconcile your fiduciary responsibility and your biblical responsibility to society. And for me, this was a because I could suddenly see the two coming together. You know, that being said, this is a tough sell. I mean, there's only about 8 to 10% of the senior executives of major corporations that are thinking this way right now. So we're still, at, I call the bleeding edge of getting this out there. You know, and we've, you know, talked to companies like Meyer. We work with a, a financial services company down in St. Louis that's actually increased their revenue by 50% applying these principles. You know, we've done those, you know, work with, with Walmart, the American Association of People with Disabilities. But it's still, it's still a little bit, new in that regard. So for me, what it's been, it's been a way of diversifying the consulting practice because in addition to the traditional corporate strategy work and business transformation that we're doing, adding this gives us a different perspective and a different cell. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I, I, if you're interested in this, by the way, and you're thinking about you know, firms, uh, and especially in consulting, ask some tough questions about this. You know, because what you'll find is that you know there are companies like you know E and Y that I've had extensive discussions about uh, with us on, who really don't even want to touch it and aren't ready for it. You know, Deloitte has a practice now that's devoted to sustainability. Um, one of my friends is at IBM trying to push this, and IBM has basically told him you can do this on nights and weekends, but during your day job you need to be selling you know doing multi-million dollar software installations. So. It depends on the type of company that you're, you're looking for. And the larger integrateds are, um, are less likely to go down this path than some of the smaller firms that are a little bit more nimble. Thanks. I see you're working with a lot of uh, 
companies that have more positive images, but for doing things like this, how do companies with more negative products such as, you know, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, how would they work more to get, you know, I know this, you know, how do they work, work more to do something like this? Because I know I think that that's, that's important as well because they, they have a lot to give to the community too. Right. Um, you know, what, you, what you'll see most of those organizations doing, you know, we call it cause-based marketing. You know, so when Budweiser puts the little sign on the bottom of this huge billboard advertising beer that says, oh, by the way, beer can be dangerous for you or don't drink and drive, that, you know, what they tend to do is they try to get involved with and contribute to causes and efforts to, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving to um, reduce adult obesity because of alcohol linked to diabetes, linked to, you know, um, uh, other, other health problems. Um, if you go back to the, um, the chart here, Most of that is either at the pure philanthropy or strategic philanthropy level. Um, it's still oftentimes I'm, I'm trying to basically uh, buy an option that I won't uh, get sued or that the, um, the, the uh, activist organizations won't come after me. I think you know, one of the questions, and I haven't, I haven't thought about it from the ATF perspective, but um, what, are, what are the social issues that a Budweiser or a Altria or somebody like that, what are the social issues that they could solve that are accretive to shareholder value in the business? No, I, I, it's kind of a rhetorical question because, quite frankly, I, I, don't, I don't have the immediate answer to that. That's a tougher one. So the, one of the companies I mentioned, the financial services company, is a company that specializes in filing social security disability claims on behalf of disabled Americans. Um, what we've recognized in our market research is that disabled Americans are in a huge need of financial services, health care services, and a whole variety of other things that they can't get. I mean, Merrill Lynch isn't going to do a financial plan for somebody that's making $12,000 a year of disability income from the government. We ended up creating a Medicare selection service and a disability life planning service and a whole variety of products and services wrapping around the needs of the disabled consumer that, had, that increased revenue 50 percent. But that, that was an easier one to solve than the one you posed. I know you've, I, I saw your hand up there. Yes, sir. I just like to see Professor Miller run a lot. Smooth. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Um, as, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> um, as reporting agencies, um, such as GRI and B Corp, um, gain a foothold in the business environment, um, and corporations begin CD seeking, um, certifications from them, what does that mean for your business model as a sustainability consulting firm? Um, does it present a complement opportunity or is it a disruption? Um, and so basically, how are you guys approaching the future? Right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's, it's how are we approaching the future. For those that aren't familiar, GRI is the um, uh, Global Reporting Initiative, thank you, um, which is a set of standards that are voluntary that were promulgated by um, a large uh, commission. And they're designed to set standards for how corporations should be reporting. There are six major categories, and within each of those categories is anywhere from six to about 15 attributes that they suggest reporting on. These reporting standards are voluntary. They've been more implemented in European-based companies now than they have in American-based companies. I work with Manpower, the large um, employee uh, firm up in Milwaukee, on their GRI report late last year. And what I found is that in the initial impl implementation of GRI, and companies like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and others are, are there, um, it tends to be much more compliance-oriented. One of the things that we did at Manpower is we tried to recast the attributes that were in the GRI reporting suggestion more into how, how are we increasing shareholder value. So instead of asking, or, or overall value, so instead of asking the question, um, you know, what is employment in your area? What we were instead asking was to what extent has manpower contributed to an overall increase of employment within the country of Hungary or India or the United States? 
and then link that to some shareholder value measures so that we could get closer to, to finding the and. Um, I think they're very complementary. Here's kind of what I see coming down the, the, coming down the pike. Uh, within five years, uh, I think there will be a much greater demand for attestation to GRI reports. Right now they're voluntary, and they're generally not being, they're certainly not being audited, and in most cases they're not being reviewed. All it takes is the plaintiff's bar to file a lawsuit against a major corporation alleging that, the, that somebody, some plaintiff made an investment decision based upon a GRI report disclosure that wasn't accurate and wasn't valid, and suddenly what's going to happen is boards of directors, the pendulum will swing, and boards of directors who hate risk are going to start insisting on reviews or attestation to any disclosures that are in a GRI report. So I think that the public accounting firms in particular are going to have a big market opportunity coming up in about four or five years to audit representations that are made in the test reports the same way they audit representations that are made in 10Ks uh, right now. I still think it's going to be a compliance effort, which doesn't affect what we've talked about here. Compliance is just the base. The question is how do you use this to drive shareholder value going forward? The other, you know, the other caution with GRI is, I mean, corporations that I've seen, um, some of which, which I, some ones I haven't mentioned, I mean, some of their GRI reporting is on Excel spreadsheets. I mean, if the board knew how, you know, inconsistent and cobbled together this information is, they'd be scared to death to have it publicly disclosed. Yes, sir. This seems like something that would be... Uh a little much easier for a more well-known uh, brand name company. But are there any lesser-known, younger companies uh, or company that is doing this really well? Or? Well, it, you actually know some of them because companies like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters are actually pretty small in the big scheme of things compared to Starbucks. But they're well-known specifically because of that. Also, the financial services company that I mentioned um, in, uh, that's in St. Louis, Fairmont Minerals, is fascinating. Um, Fairmount's based in Cleveland, Ohio. They're about a $250, $300 million industrial mineral company. They basically extract sand and silica from quarries. Because of the way that they've embraced especially environmental responsibility and then to some degree social responsibility as a source of shareholder value, um, their profit has taken off radically and they're actually winning bids or winning uh, new business on a no-bid basis because of the reputation that they have for what they're doing to the community and they're doing to the corporation. Um, I think, you know, what, what I found is that when you're dealing with a 10 to $15 million corporation, they're so trying to keep the crocodiles and the sharks and everything else at bay that they don't really pay much attention to this. Um, the multi-billion dollar corporations, this often gets wedged into the social responsibility or the community development department. The real opportunity is in those 200 million to billion sized companies which are running below the radar screen but have enough scale to make a significant difference. Uh -huh. I think we have time for one more. Um. In general, do you find that companies usually have to like increase their research and development costs in order to implement these strategies, or are they just like uh, incurring the right amount of cost but in the wrong direction? It's um, one of the reasons I would describe this as a new lens is that you know every corporation is going through a continual R and D process. They're trying to identify new products. They're trying to identify new opportunities. Um, this lens is a way of, uh, some corporations are diverting their R&D resources and saying, well, let's take a look at it this from this perspective. The second thing that they're doing is we talked about strategic philanthropy and the, feed, and the feedback loop. It costs the corporation virtually nothing to ask its employees that are involved in philanthropic activities to provide feedback back to the business from what you've learned from this activity that is a potential market opportunity. It costs them nothing, but suddenly you've got all these R&D resources that are, that are out in the field. Where it's most successful is when the CEO and the senior leadership team, when they're doing their annual strategic planning process, 
adopts this as one of the new lenses through which they're going to look to try to figure out what's going on and where the opportunities are. You know, because traditionally there's the regulatory scan of what new regulations and laws are coming up. There's the economic scan. What do we expect in terms of macroeconomic trends? There's the competitor scan. There's the what's new technology is emerging scan. This becomes another scan to add to the, to add to the list, but it becomes part of the overall planning process. So... I think why don't we why don't we um, why don't we break it here? I'll stay for a few minutes. So if you've got any questions that you want to ask one on one, I'll I'll uh, stick around for a few minutes. But it, it's been a real pleasure to be with you this evening. And okay. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And I think that was a great question to finish on to, to kind of close the loop on on where are we in this process of trying to understand not just what foresight is or how do you do foresight, but how can you make foresight a valuable lever for increasing uh, you know, business opportunity. And it, and it comes down to this idea of, of how do you find those opportunities, right? And that's where we're asking you to be right now, is to look for, through, through framing lenses, through, through, you know, Bill used the word lens, that um, you, know, you can look at it and you can say, well, yeah, so uh, just come up with some, some uh, yogurt that doesn't need to be refrigerated and make it cheap and sell it through people that are already there. And, and duh, you know, you got something. But the, the question is, how did they know to make yogurt for that part of the world, right? And that's, and that's where, where, where you guys are now. And so you talk about R&D, okay? So the, the traditional R&D is, well, how could we make a yogurt? that could be made from local milk that doesn't need refrigeration and all sorts of things. But what we're asking you to do is to take a step back. In the innovation space, they call this the discovery phase of research, right? To, to identify those needs that are emerging that, uh, that, that, that the whole industry isn't aware of yet, but they're emerging because of trends and disruptions that are occurring or haven't even arrived yet. But you can tell that they might come. Okay, that's the space we want you to be thinking in now to start to look at what are the big trends that are moving, right? What are the big uncertainties that are going on that might cause a disruption, but you can't tell one way or another? And, and zero in on those categories because that's where, that's where you find those opportunities. And from there, then you go into the, the, the traditional product development, R&D, uh, you know, f partnering up, all of those sorts of things, they fall into place. This, this uh, front end space is a space that business is asking us to do a better job in, and you guys are, are being challenged to go there. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, the questions were great. I uh, appreciate uh, you know, your, your um, uh, attendance here. Bill, thank you again. You're such a terrific speaker. We're, we're so glad to have you. And uh, so uh, enjoy the weekend, and we'll see you guys all in class next week. <laughs>